Very good. So you're very welcome to the show today. I'm Jude Marr and you're listening to the very first episode of Talking Technology with NCBI Labs. And we hope it's going to be a, a memorable show for you. In fact, you know, why not be ambitious? Let's say we hope people are going to be talking about this in 10 years, 20 years time saying, where were you on the day that? And you'll be able to look at look them in the eye, pause dramatically and say, I was there. I listened to the very first episode of talking technology with NCBI Labs. Maybe you'll even shed a tear, who knows? Well, actually, I'm, I'm pretty sure we can say for absolute fact that that won't happen, but still, we need a bit of drama to open up the show today. So there you are. It's uh, it's great to be back with you. And uh, as we said, we're in the, the new guise of talking technology with NCBI Labs. So we have plenty to talk about on the show today. First up, first up we're going to be talking about 3D printing. Now, of course, 3D printing has been around for a while, but every passing year is finding new applications for the technology. So we're going to be talking about some of the ways that the technology is already being used. And we're going to hear from our panel about the potential impact it can have in the field of sight loss. Also on the show today, is it time to ditch the PC? With all of the advances in mobile technology and how good tablets are, etc., do you, do you still need a PC or is it just irreplaceable? Well, our panel is going to be debating the issue a little bit later on. And of course, we're going to have our usual section for tech tips as well later in the show. Speaking of our panel, who do we have with us today? Well, we have some of our regular panel with us, of course. JP Corcoran is here. Hi, JP. Ah, great to be back, Jude, and uh, for our new uh, newly named podcast. It sounded like it was like the a day to remember like the moon landing or something there, Jude, with that intro. I, I <laughs> really special, wanted to big it up. Special day. <laughs> yeah, very I, I good. might have gone too far, but I'm, I'm just not sure. I <laughs> know, <laughs> oh, sure, why not? <laughs> very good. Good to have you on but the no. show today, JP. Good to be back. And, uh, and we have Daniel with us as well. Daniel Dunn is back as well. How are you getting on, Daniel? Good, Joe. Good. Um, great to be back. Um, and love the new um, title layout. So uh, great job uh, by the design team and coming up with the new logo. Uh, looks it looks very very smart indeed. So looking forward to um, another year. Yeah, of um, of uh, getting on here and talking about technology and you know keep keeping up to up to speed with the latest developments in technology. Um, yeah. I suppose your introduction there about where were you on such a day, um, yeah, definitely, you know, uh, where, where were you today, the moon landing, it's definitely up there with the tanks. <laughs> it's definitely, we've got to be ambitious, yeah, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> it's definitely up there. Very good, so that's two, the two of our uh, of our regular panel that uh, you'll be well used to hearing their voices anyway. Now, you'll have heard the voices of uh, our other guests on the panel uh, this week as well. But uh, we have back with us David Nason. Welcome back, David. You've been on before Thanks, uh, to talking be to us about a few different things. Absolutely. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, and yeah. to be on the first of the new one. I'm slightly concerned that I'm not up to the challenge of that you've set in that introduction, but like, <laughs> see how we get on. I tell you what, if even the listeners are, are able to say in 10 years' time, where were you? What, what are the presenters going to be able to say? That's <laughs> incredible. Yeah, <laughs> I was actually there. I was presenting. I was a guest panelist. Incredible. Good to have you with us, David. And we have Des Keeney as well. Very welcome to the show, Des. Thank you, Jude. Uh, looking forward to the chat. I'm tr I'm thinking, Des. We I know we had you on the show last year as well. Was it was it the weather apps we had you on for? It was, wasn't it? Yeah, the favorite topic. Just uh, talking about the weather apps and so on and. Yeah, uh, very unfortunately, good. we haven't got much moved to hearing yet, but we, we hope to get there. <laughs> well, good to have you back on the show with us, and we look forward to hear, hearing from you throughout the show as well. So uh, we're we're going to have a chance to to chat to our panel a little bit more in a few moments, but just before we do, we just want to mention very quickly a couple of things about the change to uh, to the show. Uh, talking technology, as we said, is the is the new name. And uh, if you're if you're able to see the, what's on the the screen for the Teams meeting as well, or if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see there's a bit of a different look to it as well. Format wise, there's going to be a lot of similarities, and there's going to be a few things that are a bit different. So um, we're we know that actually a lot of people 
uh, gave us a lot of feedback about the, the live events last year and there was a lot of uh, features that people very much liked. So we're not going to change the show too much. We're still going to be focusing on the technology that makes a difference to people with sight loss. We're still going to have special guests from both the leading names in accessible technology as well as hearing from those with new innovations. We're still going to have our regular panel as, as you've heard from there and we're going to have things like tech tips, some of the regular features. But we're also going to have a bit more of a focus on your own experience, your viewpoints as listeners, as service users of NCBI, people who use the technology regularly. Uh, so most weeks our panel is going to be expanded a little bit to include some friends of the show, really previous guests or listeners who can get involved in the discussions each week and put a different side to some of our debates as well. So we're going to be asking some of our, our uh, listeners to do some uh, user reviews of some of the technologies too, so that'll be a, a feature of our shows going forward. We're also going to be bringing in some opportunities or some more opportunities to talk about emerging technologies, maybe mainstream technologies, how they can impact the sight loss community and some of the innovations that might not have a wide application at the moment, but uh, we might just bring those into the discussion a little bit to see where they could go as well and, and to a degree that's what we're going to be doing today in our first subject. But just before we move into that first subject, how can you help? Uh, if you if you want to be involved, if you want to contribute to the show, how can you do that? Well, if you hear of something new, something we haven't talked about before, please do let us know. We'll be happy to include it on the show and give our take on it. Previously, we've always been kind of careful to make sure that we're presenting the uh, pieces of technology that are of most use to you and we'll we'll still be kind of making sure that that's uh, the focus the central focus of the show but if there's something that you want to hear a little bit about or even hear the the opinion of the the panel on a particular piece of technology please do, do let us know and we'll be happy to to give you an opinion on that a little bit of a, a some sort of a, a review or a mention anyway um, so that you can get a sense of uh, what that technology is like. So please do get in touch. Let us know if there's ones that you want us to talk about. And if you'd like to do a review of a specific piece of technology that you've found very helpful or not so helpful for that matter. Well, again, get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. We might not be able to have everybody on uh, immediately uh, when we get the email, but we'll certainly um, keep you in mind. Get in touch and uh, we'll talk to you and hopefully we can uh, find a way to bring that onto the show as well. As usual, the way to contact us is by email to labs at ncbi.ie and uh, you can use that to let us know uh, any of the features you want us to cover or you can use that throughout the show today as well if you want to get involved. If you're joining through um, uh, Microsoft Teams, uh, then you can use the question panel on the right of your screen as well. So with all that out of the way and a bit of an outline of, of what's happening with uh, talking technology with NCBI Labs. Let's move on to our first subject for today. And it's actually one of those emerging technologies that we mentioned. Now, 3D printing has been around for a little while, uh, but why why is it of interest to us? Well, that's the question that we're going to be posing to our panel in just a moment. But to start with, it's probably good for us to get a bit of a sense of the technology and how it works. Maybe JP, are you able to give us a, a little bit of an idea of just, just how does 3D printing work? Of course, you'll be very happy to give us some, some context and a bit of a background to 3D printing. So for anyone who's not familiar with 3D printing, so what is it? It's, it's basically, it's, it's this type of printing, it's known as additive manufacturing. So it's basically a method of creating a three-dimensional object layer by layer using a computer created design. So 3D printing is what's known as an additive process, as I say, where layers are built up um, to create a 3D part. And it's the opposite of what's called subtractive manufacturing processes, where a final design is cut back actually from a larger block of material. So in this sense, like 3D printing creates less material wasted. So in terms mm -hmm. of actually how this process works, so it's much like a printing on a typical inject printer, which we're all familiar with. So a 3D printer creates a model over a period of hours, sometimes it actually be days, believe it or not, which effectively mm -hmm. separates uh, 2D, uh, 2D prints that sit on top of one another without the paper in between them. 
Okay, so that's the difference mm. between that, the and the and the HP uh, or the inject printer. So in this way, the 3D printer actually deposits layers of what's called molten plastic or powder and fuses them together with adhesive or ultraviolet UV light. In terms of what materials are used in 3D printing, uh, there's a variety of 3D printing materials available, including thermoplastics, which is the most common one, metals, resins, and ceramics. But it is thermoplastics or molten plastic that is the most widely used. And then as well, in terms of how long it takes 3D uh, uh, printing to, to, to do, do 3D printing, the printing time does depend on a number of factors, like for example, the size of the part, the settings used for printing, and uh, the quality uh, of the finished part is also important when determining printing time. It's higher quality items, take longer to produce than maybe not so higher quality items. Mm -hmm. The 3D printing time can take anything from a few minutes, uh, hours, or as I say, even days. Um, speed, uh, resolution, and the volume of the materials are uh, all the important factors here. So that's kind of like a bit of a background in 3D printing, yeah. like what it is and how it works. But I think we're very shortly we're going to be talking about in theory, the, the applications for 3D printing. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. And it, it, it's very interesting technology, actually, when you think about it, just that mm. idea of kind of building up layer by layer. You could make nearly anything. It is, yeah. That. And uh, it yeah, is. that's yeah, the, the sky is the limit, isn't it? They say the, your, your limit is, is your imagination when it comes to the 3D printing. Yeah, yeah, yeah very, that's very, it. very versatile. Mm. And even just kind of when you're trying to picture how that works, we were talking about it earlier and uh, it was mentioned just the idea of like, for example, if you're if you're going to print out a sphere, well, that, that, mm. that's not necessarily going to uh, stand in its own right very well. So sometimes it'll actually come almost like it'll print it with a, a little um, framework almost to hold it up and you just kind of mm. remove that framework at the end, which is again, it's very clever when you think about mm. how that works. Let's think about just some of the applications of it. We'll bring in our whole panel here because um, the variety of experience will be kind of interesting just to hear from. Um, just what sort of ways has this technology been used already? Maybe we can throw that open to the panel who's oh, going to yeah. jump in first. <laughs> He does here, Jude. Um, one yeah. of the things I'd be very interested in in this med ter medium term is really about tactile maps and as to whether it can work for that. Um, it would seem a great way of printing out what you're, what, you know, whatever size map you want and maybe a contour map and all that sort of thing. I guess yeah. the question I would have with regard to the usefulness of it is whether you can identify um, what's in what part on the map um, in the, in, from the point of view that it's not actually interactive. But if, if it's printing out, for example, a town and so on, it would be absolutely brilliant to be able to feel the streets and the buildings and identify what's what. But the difficulty with that, I think, would be to um, actually know what building is standing up the tallest and what street corner you're on and so on. And yeah, if, yeah. I think if that could yeah. be worked around, then, then it would be, be absolutely fantastic. I think that's actually a really in, interesting in, in application. In, in, yeah. Um, um, what we might do is we'll, in, we'll, in, we'll come back to talking about that as well in a moment, because I think we want to look at some of the applications for sight loss in a few minutes. And that's, that sort of fits in very nicely with that as well. Just just broadly speaking, um, I know that we will have heard of um, 3D printing being used in a variety of, of kind of of other circumstances already. Um, maybe not even to do with sight loss. What sort of things has it been used for already? Yeah, I suppose um, if I come in there, Joe, there, <clears throat> you know, yeah. there's loads of little cool things um, that, that can be printed out, you know, mm. um, from cards and little spinners and things like that. Um, I was just on a on a website there earlier that kind of come out with about 70 different different things to print now as far as I'm aware there um, that you can download the little plans for these and pop them in pop them into the, the software that drives the 3D printer but um you know it's it's little household um, trinkets I suppose is, is is a good bit of stuff that I see here you know stuff like mobile phone holders uh, clips to hold cables in place maybe around your laptop at your desk um, yeah, yeah you know uh, wallets as uh, holders for your glasses, things like that. So these are these are the things that people have come up with and, and uh, designed and um, you know things like that that people can I suppose use around around their house. You know yeah. um, there like there is 
there is um, definitely more serious stuff um, out there uh, that you might have come across in news stories. Um, but these little things that are handy for around the house, um, you know, are, are definitely uh, doable as well. It doesn't always have to be the yeah, kind of yeah. standout piece. And uh, it, it can often be, you know, useful little bits and bobs that you can put together uh, and uh, make, make in, in your own home, you know. I think that's interesting because it's kind of just when you were listing some of those things there, I was thinking, yeah, it can be used for so many different little things around mm. the home that you don't want to have to go out and buy this thing that will cost you 10 cents, but actually you could print it at home or, you know, there could be mm. hundreds of things. But then as you start to try and list hundreds of things, they're the sort of things that don't come easily to mind. So it's kind of, it's good to to hear some of those suggestions. What, what are some of the more eye-catching ones? You mentioned there that there are some of the kind of big things as well. Yeah, um, like even, um, now obviously, I'm going to say here, somebody created a violin on a 3D printer. Now, obviously, it's not going to be printed and you pick it up and you start playing it. Um, <laughs> no, often these often these more elaborate creations, you will create the parts and you, you still have to assemble them or do a certain amount of um, assembly to them, you know, to, to fit them together and to work afterwards. And, you know, obviously, it's not going to print the, the strings of a violin. They're going to have to be bought separate and fitted. But yeah. um, you know, it does have um, it, it. It does have potential in in you know something like that. I've also uh, been uh, finding out that um, in healthcare, like there's um, they're looking at 3D printing of you know of actual printing living tissue is 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 the next thing that's coming on uh, that's been studied and. You know, so it's it's it, the, the possibilities of this three three D printing is yeah, absolutely yeah. incredible. You know, so um, you know, if you needed if you needed some living tissue or an organ part, you know, three D bioprinting is is another field that this kind of branches off out into as well. So the future is definitely definitely exciting for this. That's actually incredible, isn't it? That the medical mm -hmm. use there is is amazing as well. Yeah, yeah, very good. Uh, any other things that that any of the panel have heard of? I think yeah, just just uh, going on with the the medical usage, um, came across a um, story of a man in the UK who received the very first uh, prosthetic uh, 3D printed eye, which is very impressive, you know. So um, it's a really really good 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 news story there. Mm -hmm. um, but like medical uses are are obviously vast, along with other things like I say Daniel was mentioning like things artificial tissues, cells, skin, uh, you know, organs. Limbs parts, well, livers, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's incredible, you know, and you can think of, you know, limbs maybe for a child as the child grows older, that, you know, maybe the, the 3D printer will be able to, you know, print uh, different uh, size limbs, you know, when, when the child is developing yeah, yeah. and so forth. So yeah. uh, huge advances in, in 3D printing are, are, are helping with that. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting to see how things will move in, in that direction in medicine. Well, and wider applications as well. Yeah, so go ahead there, Daniel. I see yeah. another one here, like, um, you know, chocolate um mm. 3d printing a chocolate so you want to do a customized cake yes, or yeah. you know customized <laughs> chocolate bar or something mm. like that like yeah. you know it's it's it's, it's like crazy that, yeah, yeah. where this yeah. thing can go yeah and i even seen where uh and this is probably a little bit of a, a tongue-in-cheek this one but uh, a 3d printer printed a 3d printer <laughs> 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 now we're going oh, into some levels of madness exception. here. It's like <laughs> some, yeah. This, Imagination. This is what's going like to make this. the first show memorable, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought that'd be like uh, typing Google into Google search engine. <laughs> Just yeah, crash yes. Google, you know. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> kind of what it does, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> That's it. It is incredible though when you talk about it, because like. The, just as you mentioned there, like the application of using it for chocolate on the one hand, um, but then you've got like. Um, instruments, musical instruments, you've got medical applications. Mm -hmm. I had seen a, an application of the technology. Obviously, it's a bit a bit different from a home printer, but actually it's it's just a play on words for the home printer because I've seen it printing a home before, printing a house. It's the same kind of technology, um, obviously a bigger kind of application, but the same idea of kind of printing layer by layer by layer, um, which is incredible when you think about it. Absolutely amazing. I think we had a, a video, did we, of one of the things you mentioned, Daniel? You mentioned um, the uh, musical instruments there. 
I think we have a video that we can yeah. play. Do we yeah, have that I lined can, up? I can just pop that up. Um, give me a moment there now. Right. So, um, let me see. I might even have it here now if I can. Yeah, I have it. Uh, I have it and even just while Daniel's doing that, uh, just while you're getting that set up there, Daniel came across another case of um, in, in China, in Shanghai, there was a private company that created uh, 10 houses using 3D printing. That's pretty impressive. Oh, yeah, yeah. Into the area yeah. of housing. Mm. Yeah, it is amazing. Let's yeah. let's have a listen to this because it's yes. kind of interesting just to hear if if you're talking about 3D printing something, is the quality actually any good? Well, this was um, the 3D printed violin. See, see what you think of the sound of this. gives us a bit of a taste of that. That sounds pretty yeah. good to me. Sounds it does pretty mean, good to me. Quality, yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? I, I would notice a difference. Yeah. yeah. It's absolutely good? incredible. <laughs> I think there's an orchestra actually in Canada. I, I read about uh, an orchestra in Canada that all of the uh, instruments that they were using were actually 3D printed. Um, so that'd be that'd be quite an experience just to <laughs> to hear that as well. I think it'd be amazing. Mm. Um, and and the the interesting thing with this as well, there's the variety of of quality because obviously you've got the cheaper end of it. You might be able to get a home three D printer, and it'll be a bit rough and ready, but it'll be kind of useful mm. enough. But you'll have kind of the the higher end things where you can maybe um, actually have a plan that you um, forward on to a company and they'll print it for you. And your quality yeah. levels will change a bit, a bit um, quite substantially, I guess. So it's, it is interesting just to think of, of where it can go. Just yeah, um, I, I sorry, think you on. make a good point there. I think you make a very good point there, Joe. Like a 3D printer in every house, maybe, maybe not. Um, mm. You know, I suppose a couple of years, a couple of years or even 10 years ago, like um, printers, printers are you know, had a marketing edge in the shops that all oh, print your photographs at home and all this kind of thing. Mm. And I think it worked out for people that, you know, it was a little bit on the expensive side by the time you got your glossy paper, by the time you got your high end ink and put it into your into your standard household printer and printed off the photographs, you weren't really saving a whole pile. And now yeah. what we see is, you know, most people, if they're getting photographs, I say, after smartphone, you just pop them in an app and they thing the photographs are printed out and posted back to you. And I think that's the way it's going to work for, tree, you know, 3D printing for a lot of people. Now, maybe somebody who's into arts and crafts and things like that or has a specific purpose for a, a 3D printer, but couldn't see them being in everyone's home yeah, to be more yeah. of a service delivery. Yeah, yeah, it does. I, yeah. I don't know if I'm the most yeah, skeptical one in the group. I think in the, in Go on, well, let's take Dave first and then we'll come to Des after that. Sorry. That's okay. Sure. Uh, I don't know if I'm the cynic in the group. <laughs> I'm a bit like, I, like it says a pretty good technology and I can see it being really useful for kind of manufacturing certain things in a more efficient mm. way and all. Whether we, you and I will see the benefit of it in any real way, I'm sort of skeptical about. Um, yeah. Um, you know, because like, you know, I don't think that the pre-dream printer in every home, I don't know, that and is off. that is that um, like a, a cost thing that you're thinking, Dave, or is that cost more the, the practicality? Yeah. Well, how many things practically do I need per year that would be worth having a printer and <laughs> printing them out myself? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think maybe the customization is where maybe you could be onto something like so, like say you have mm. a company that has the parts and the materials to do it professionally, but you want this product, but you want a slightly customized version of it or whatever. That's where yeah. I, probably where I could most see it opening up to just ordinary people benefiting from it. Des, yeah. what's your take on this? Well, my feeling really is, is a backup to what Daniel and Dave have been saying, that in the current setup, the uh, 3D printers don't seem that easy to set up um, as a home printer. 
Yeah. Um, anything I've read about it says that it's definitely not a plug and play and you have to set up the bed perfectly level and you have to get all the, the three axes working fine and all that. And again, like Dave was saying there, I just, I'm not sure that that's for everybody at home in the, in the short term. Now, as the technology develops, maybe that can get better and get easier and so on. Um, but I particularly can't really see people with vision impairment taken to that in any great way um, as it currently stands. Yeah, yeah. So so where we're at at the moment might have a, a bit of a difficulty. It's interesting, though, when you kind of throw into that the idea that let's say the, the technology continues to improve and actually what's available to somebody in their own home is of a higher standard. It was interesting when when we were looking at the musical instruments earlier. There's one company now that's actually um, uh, they've got the the plans are actually free for somebody to use personally. They estimate the costs would be something like seventy dollars um, for the raw materials to print your own violin. Um, mm -hmm. That is like an imitation of a famous, I think, is Stradivarius as well. Actually, um, and it, it's like seventy dollars. You would have your finished piece. Now, what the quality on that one is like, I think it's supposed to be kind of fairly decent, but maybe not the absolute highest. But $70, if you had the technology reaching the stage where you could print that at home, would that be a game changer? Would you not just be able to still buy it in a shop for the same price? Well, there you go. I suppose this yeah. is the is interesting thing. Is my kind of thinking thing. of it. I'm not quite sure why, why yeah. I want to. And are you thinking that's like a, a 3D printed one as well, though? Potentially, yeah, that's what I mean by I think yeah, like yeah, manufacturers, yeah. I think, can benefit from it hugely, but whether we will want it in our homes. But then again, like I say, maybe. Yeah, I'm yeah. Cynic. I think, I think um, maybe <clears throat> maybe where some households might pick up the 3D printer is, you know, maybe somebody's into their golf and they want to print off a few tees or maybe a few golf balls yeah. or something like that. Maybe, but, um, you know, it's, yeah, you have yeah. to kind of think of something that's um, not, not necessarily mass produced, but would be produced regularly enough. Mm. Um, over over a short enough time scale to warrant having it. So I'm just picking up then from mm. from kind of the discussion so far. I think actually we're probably all um, fairly close to each other in in the opinion that you know a, a home device isn't necessarily going to be the 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 most practical at the moment. But actually the technology itself is quite interesting and useful. Just maybe not with a home application. Is that mm. kind of fair to say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, I think so, dude. Yeah, I think you sound a lot well. Yeah. So, so maybe then, if if that's the case, if the if the technology itself is useful, not necessarily talking about home use, but if you want to bring that in as well, then then do. But how would we apply this then to um, the sight loss field? Now, we're not necessarily talking about somebody with sight loss actually having the technology and having to work it. But just even how how might the sight loss field actually benefit from this being a technology that can continue to go from strength to strength? Yeah, I suppose if it was um, if it was available, well, obviously it's it, it's available. The three D printers are out there, and I suppose there's more commercial um, you know com commercial offerings I think come in stream where by you can you know you can get you can get in touch with a 3D printing house, let's say, and you wanted yeah. certain things printed off, you know, that you uh, maybe that you'd source the plans or or they might have a library of, of things that they can print and they can do it and get it out to you fairly quickly. I think that that's probably where I see it's going to go, you know, kind of like your you know your online ink service where you, you know you're looking for ink for your printer and you've, you go online you order and it gets delivered um rather than going to the shop or something like that you know so yeah yeah i, I think i think that's the way it is going it's definitely going to be an element of online offering um yeah. and yeah. probably you log on to some you know some house that does this to have a catalog you go through and seek the product you want and they print it and ship it to you yeah, yeah I, and as you mentioned right. Yeah. Sorry, go on. Go ahead, I was going to say just, I think, I think Des, Des might echo, echo this in a moment, but um, Des obviously is interested in outdoor maps and, and creating the custom outdoor maps. And mm. I think we actually laid mm. LinkedIn a couple of weeks ago about a uh, site touch mapper. And on this site, you can create custom outdoor maps for any address of your choice once you enter your address on the website. And that gives you the option to do it, to either print the map yourself, should you have 3D printer, which not everyone will have, of course, or you can order a 3D print 
at a cost. So it's giving that people the option. Uh, you know, you'd expect at this point in time, maybe things will be different in five, ten years time. But at this point in time, people will probably be going for the online service of having it printed for them if they really wanted that. You know, um, yeah. things might change as as the technology evolves and becomes a bit cheaper and a bit more affordable in in the future. But that's what people might do at present. Maybe I'll go with yeah. the Desde. You're going to ask a question about yeah. No, I was actually just well, thinking the same the same subject because mm, I know Des mentioned yeah. the yeah three uh, D three D maps earlier on. Um, mm. Do you reckon that that's a, a go or Des? Do you think that that's something that I mean, not necessarily even ha as it is at the moment, but just is that something you can envisage being a practical application in the future? I think it is. Um, like um, I was looking at that site that you were talking about there, and I think it costs. 35 euro to get the map printed mm. and that's just the quality is good and so on I, and, and I have no idea what the quality is like but that mm. five year wouldn't break the bank and um, the only trouble is that then if you know if I want to print it in my local area up here in Leeton and then I want to go down to Mayo and you're printing another one and the next day you're mm. going down to Galway the whole thing starts to mount up um, and there's also the problem of interpreting where each place is as I, as I was saying about the street maps and so on I think there's massive potential there, but there's certainly a gap for the blind people as to how they identify what's what on the map. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I think it's I, for me it's really interesting because part of my difficulty now is that I have trouble knowing where, for example, Boyle is in relation to Sligo and Balna, um, and if I could actually touch it on the map, then that would be brilliant. And um, other times I'm trying to sort out, say, the shape of Van Bogan or whatever, and to have a 3D map of that would be extremely helpful. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And that would work certainly easily for me because I know where the towns and, and so on are around that area um, and I could easily orientate myself on that and I think that would be brilliant. Um, but the next step with, with those maps is really how somebody goes to a strange area, they have a 3D map and they can identify all the, all the issues. And, and that's where the problem comes in, in that you might have a layer for towns and so on. But then what about all the symbols for rivers and roads and all that type of thing? And that's it's a whole yeah. different area of complication when you're trying to turn a 2D map into a 3D equivalent. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and just even hearing you describe that, you can definitely see the the kind of difficulties that would be there, the challenges that be there. Mm -hmm. Can I can I put maybe a concept yeah. to to the panel and just again see what see if you think this is something where there could be applications to this. It's it's one of the sort of the slightly um, rarer applications that I've heard of or the more unusual ones. And yet I can see it being something that there's something to take from as well. Just where some um, some places are actually 3D printing baby scans for expectant couples. Um, now, something like that for a sight loss application for an expectant parent, <laughs> Um, mm. With sight loss, who can't see the the kind of scan that will come across, D is that sort of thing um, the idea of being able to represent something that's a concept almost in a three D form? Is, is that useful? Is that something that you can see being applied in other ways? What do you think yeah, of think of, of that specific one? <laughs> yeah, it's a strange one. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think it's something I wouldn't go for it. myself, um, but I could see why some people would go for it and how mm. how it could be very very useful for for people with with, uh, with no vision. Um, definitely has an application. Um, you know, mm. yeah, it's, it's it's one of the more interesting ones. It is, yeah, mm. Mm. I was thinking as well if we. Um, I know it's kind of mapping again, but indoor as well, like so, you know, if you're going to a new school or a college or whatever, a new workplace to be able to yeah. kind of just be given a, a floor map to give you a sense of the layout of that of that building or, or even I play um, pigeon pair tennis and I know sometimes particularly the, the B1, the blind, totally blind players who may, may, may never have seen, don't have a, a concept of what even a tennis court is laid out like. So having a 3D kind of construction of that, they're very, they'd be quite more simple kind of maps, but they'd be kind of useful yeah, to give yeah. people just a concept mm. of, of a, what a plan, a, you know, floor plan. Mm. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think that's a very interesting idea for people who have never seen something, 
um, and it's too big to actually touch in one go, then, or you know, even the shape of the house, for example, if you're getting a house built and the architect could produce a 3D model of it, then the mm-hmm. plan person would certainly have a much better chance of understanding what's being designed and so on. I think I think that'd be yeah. a great application. Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, yeah. some of some of the good architects um, even do make uh, these 3D kind of layout models. They're probably out of bits of wood that they that they mm-hmm. put together. Um, you know, so I think it probably this this kind of 3D plans <clears throat> probably will come more and more mainstream rather than uh, for you know you often probably see these 3D models that the architects have created usually going to be at the higher end of the market. Um, yeah. You know, for your million euro plus homes and things like that. Um, but for I think for more generic, you know, building plans and things like that, the 3D printing of it um, definitely I think is another potential use for it. I think it's a it's a very interesting discussion that we've been having with the. 3D printing because the technology is very interesting but as has been pointed out by the panel I think it's there's there's limitations where you know we don't necessarily just jump onto something because it can do amazing things in in some scenarios there's also big limitations in some ways but it's just interesting to to be able to think about a, a a piece of technology that is actually able to to do like the limit is sometimes the imagination in some ways isn't it? it's like mm-hmm. actually if the mm-hmm. imagination is fairly active is. there could be a lot of different ways it could, I, I think even ama- it's amazing jp you mentioned about mm. cosmetic uh, th- like the purpose of like uh, mm. an, a false eye for example yeah. um again that's going to be of of interest but it's it's just that somebody actually had to think of let's let's yeah. use it this way Mm-hmm. Exactly, it's it's kind of uh, being kind of using kind of lateral thinking, isn't it, isn't it with it? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. it. That's yeah, it. Uh, yeah. Well, and I think it's well with, with the lowering cost you know, of of three D printing yeah. that'll hopefully it'll hopefully help kind of three D printing spread out of the industrial use into you know schools and homes a bit more in, yeah. in, in the, in the future. Mm. Well, I think that's that's been a really good um, conversation, and uh, appreciate all your comments on that. Good to get the panel involved in. Um, D- debating a little bit the the uh, pros and cons with 3D printing, but uh, where it can be applied in the future. And if any of our listeners have any suggestions or things that they think it could go that direction as well, do get in touch because it's just interesting for us to keep those things in mind as well. It might be something we um, need to revisit at some point or uh, see see how it could continue to be used. So why not get in, in touch and join the discussion? Email us at labs at ncbi.ie if you'd like to do that. Very good. I think time wise, we probably better move on to our next section because we have a a bit of a a debate uh, (laughs) coming up and this will be kind of interesting to see where this goes because we're going to talk about the idea of do I really need a PC anymore? Now, I'm going to begin just this section with a quote from Steve Jobs back in uh, 2010. He said this back 11 years ago now, 12 years ago nearly. When when we were an agrarian nation, all cars were trucks. But as people moved towards urban centres, people started to get into cars. I think PCs are going to be like trucks. Less people will need them. And this transformation is going to make some people uneasy because the PC has taken us a long way. They were amazing, but it changes. Vested interests are going to change. And I think we've embarked on that change. Now, that was what he said back in 2010. He was envisaging that computing is going to take on a, maybe a bit of a different form. And he mentioned that that he thought that the kind of start of that process had already taken place. So where do we stand 12 years later? Are we at the point now where a PC is no longer necessary for the average technology user? Does the need for accessibility options make PCs more necessary or less necessary? Well, that's what the panel is going to be debating. Let's get everybody's kind of opening position on this. Just uh, maybe just kind of the, the basic overview of uh, where where people stand. So could we start with Des? Are you kind of, do you, do you fall on the side of you absolutely have to have a PC or you can get away without one? Well, just to give you a little bit of background, Jude, I lost the last of my central vision about uh, less than a year ago. Um, so I'm relatively new to the whole screen um, reader and that type of thing. 
So I, I have learned uh, voiceover and I'm using it on the phone. So at the moment, I'm very much a phone user. I yeah. used to be a competent PC user and I used to use Excel to quite a high level and Word to sort of reasonably high level. Um, and at the moment, I haven't got uh, Word or Excel on the, on, on the phone um, because I've been messing around with subscriptions and so on and basically I've been too mean to buy it in the short term. <laughs> But that's something I'm coming to very, very quickly. Um, however, I mean, I, I'm, I'm very thankful that I'm losing my sight at this stage in, in, in the calendar because looking even 10 years ago, um, the amount of things that are available on the phone then were nothing compared to now. Like now, I use it a lot for navigation. I use Google, Google Maps, um, you know, just audio version of it. I use... Um, Soundscape a lot, and particularly for recreational kayaking, I found that brilliant. Um, yeah. I, I use Seeing AI and other text readers and so on. And that is, is absolutely amazing, being able to use that and being able to carry it around and put it in my pocket. I have one device, the, you know, I have a few extras for it, but that's it, I'm using the phone. Now, having said yeah. that, I'm at the point of starting to learn JAWS and it's driving me nuts because it's all so new all over again. It's completely different from once over. Um, and I find it very frustrating at the moment. Now, I've never gone on a course for either of them, and that's probably mostly because of COVID. Um, but I'm, 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 I'm seriously wondering at this stage whether it's worth my while going to the, the PC. For yeah, example, yeah. can I get the Excel file and, and the Word files that I've, I've used? And I just get them over onto the phone and work like that. I mean, at the moment, I use the phone for the e for email, for writing writing articles, and um, all that type of thing. And uh, you know, I, I use yeah, it yeah. along with Hey Siri and all that type of thing. And I found it great. And I'm very good. I'm I'm really interested to see what what the guys who are pushing the yeah, yeah. PC are yeah. going to say because. Um, I'm quite yeah, happy yeah. to lose the debate from the point of view that if I lose it, then I'll have, I'll have more motivation to learn PC stuff. So, yeah, yeah. That's where I'm at. It sounds like you're open to persuasion in this one, Des. It sounds like you're pretty much, pretty yeah, much over to the, yeah, over to the kind of um, mobile technology side for the for the start of it. But we'll see we'll see where you end up. Dave, what what side of the debate are you on? I'm, I, yeah, I'm kind of on the PC side, uh, the PC is still necessary side, like I, I love my phone and my tablet and they do so much and, and it, for me it really depends what you need, so I could not do my job without a PC with just phone and tablet, this is great. just this is great. could not do it. It's square like, enough already, so that's great. <laughs> <laughs> and like uh, it's interesting des mentioned excel oh my god try to use excel on your phone good luck to you like it's it's just horrendous um <laughs> even with the keyboard attached and voiceover Excellent. you know once you got, i, I so don't know looking if you forward to this voiceover. debate yeah i'm so <laughs> looking forward got... to... let's just check in with jp and daniel first of all just to to make sure we've the, the, the <laughs> we're, still, we're still here dude <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll make sure the sides are kind of clear here who's on whose side here <laughs> jp who, which side are you on ah uh, sure well I, i'm gonna go with uh i'll be with des today now this was from, from my point of view uh i'm coming from someone who uses both a smartphone and, and computer and work and for leisure and I think, like 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 Des, I can recognise the value in, in both devices, uh, both devices, and like and like Dave. Uh, but today, though, I'll be kind of on Des' side. I'm going to highlight some of the advantages of, of the smartphone that it'll have over your typical computer. Um, so you're going to I know that side. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to go in with the Daniel good. and I come back? You know what? Yeah, I'll just check in with Daniel. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Jude, I had to uh, log back in on my computer there. The, the phone wasn't able to, <laughs> to, to get me in here. That's a dirty, uh, trick. That's a dirty trick there. Oh, good one. Good one. So, I think we know what side Daniel's going to be on. <laughs> we, we can dial it on your mobile, Daniel. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> okay, um, but the sides have been drawn. I, th I think the sides have been drawn here. So let's just open up. With, I think we should come back to JP for a moment because... Uh, JP, you were gonna, mm. you, you had something else to, to bring well, in there. When just, just was for my own um, background. I know I've had some discussions in the past, Jude, of 
under the term, which is the data platform, Apple or Android. Um, and we've had people who've been sticking to one side or another resolutely. Um, I've been fortunate to try both types of phones, so Android and Apple. And over the years, I've, I've used three or four different Apple's uh, Android phones. Over the last phones, HTC's, Huawei, Samsung. Currently, I'm using XOR, iPhone XOR, mainly because I want to to be honest, to fully familiar myself with the different accessibility offerings it has, apps like Seeing AI, Soundscape, etc. Um, so yeah, kind of coming from the point of view that good things can come in small packages today. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but if you go there on, there was a sneaky away. laugh there from David. <laughs> <laughs> I think. No, I think. You know. statement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah. Yeah. Very good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. <laughs> so I think we've got plenty to work with here. I think that there's definitely uh, there's definitely both sides of the, the debate can be heard. I wonder if a, a good place to start um, might be, let, let's kind of break it down a little bit. If I was to kind of open the subject or open the category of entertainment, for example, because sometimes we just talk about productivity um, and we'll come to productivity in a minute, but can we start with entertainment? So. Is a, is a PC necessary for for entertainment purposes? Absolutely not for me. <laughs> yeah, I have to agree. Like I use YouTube, use Netflix, Amazon, any 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 of those things. I use them on my my tablet and on my phone. I wouldn't. I hate them on my PC. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's almost the opposite. Like I just find navigating those websites and stuff much more awkward than nav navigating a you know a nice native app that they have on on the phone or a tablet. So. I think for that, and I even my my mum like is a great example of someone because this will come back to what we're talking about is like need what you need these things for. Like she has absolutely no need for a laptop, so she just has an iPad and her phone, you know, because she doesn't need some of the the stuff that where PCs are better. But yeah, I, I personally think entertainment works much better on on phone and tablet. It seems yeah. like it seems, <laughs> go on. I, I use the from an entertainment point of view. I I would use the phone a lot for audio books and borrow box and um, Audible and that sort of stuff. I'd also listen to music on it, and I would look at well listen to YouTube and um, the RTE uh, app as well. And um, I, I don't I, I don't do gaming, and I'm not really into films and and so on. And it pretty much does everything that I need, um, and mm. it does it well. Um, so, you know, I, I think from an entertainment point of view, there isn't much more I want. And even if a PC can do more on the gaming side, then it doesn't really bother me because that's not what I'm interested in. So possibly mm. it depends what you want to do in it. And I don't know if there's any gamers there that can comment on the PC versus phone side. Mm. I've probably hung down a lot to dry there, have I? Uh, yeah, that's 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 right there, no, um, <laughs> like I suppose. Look, I suppose the fairest thing to say is that uh, both both uh, style of devices have their pros and cons. And I suppose when we're talking about PC, um, we're including laptops in that because they're also personal computers. Um, you know, it's the laptop and PC thing has moved on from the day where it was either a, a portable laptop or. Uh, PC that was stuck in the corner of of your uh, sitting room or your bedroom or whatever, so PC is a little bit more uh, encompassing now. So, like you have portability with your laptops, you're going to have more power and better memory, um, easier integration with um, you know ex external external devices. You know whether they're USB powered or Bluetooth as well. You know it's, it's a simple thing to connect up a, a USB keyboard or a USB mouse to your laptop or your PC. Not so easy to do it for your tablet, um, or your, or even your smartphone. So, like there definitely, definitely is pros and cons to 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 both sides. Uh, having more power in your in your PCs and your laptops, uh, better for gaming. That's if you're into it. But even if you're not, um, you know, even for watching YouTube on a on a on a laptop, like your standard screen on a laptop is 15.6 inches, is 19 inches on a on a on a PC or 22 mm. inch now is the standard screen. So automatically there for somebody with low vision, you have a much greater view in area. So there is definitely is uh, pros and cons on both sides. OK, the websites is, might be a little bit more 
tricky to navigate around, but you know, it's getting familiar with those after a while. You you, you don't think twice about it. And like with your Chrome browser, you have the crass uh, the, the cast straight off your browser uh, tab. Now, if you are on YouTube and you wanted to pop it over to Chromecast onto your big sitting room TV or whatever, you have that mm -hmm. option as well. So they are they are versatile as well. I'll add that into the mix. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, to be fair, I kind of thought of entertainment as nearly like if you were to pick the strengths of the, the mobile options um, and you were to think of an easy win for the mobile options, I, I probably would have thought that actually that would have been where the smartphones had come out yeah. particularly strong. But I think that was mm. quite, a, quite a strong defense from Daniel. Let's let <laughs> Daniel go on the offensive. Daniel, if you were to pick a category that would be the kind of, you know, the, the real strength of a PC, here's the, the end of the conversation. This is why you need a PC. W uh, would I be right in saying that that would be to do with productivity or, or how would you make your case? Absolutely productivity and even even um, online shopping. Um, one thing I noticed that, um, let's say I'll just start off with the shopping end of it first because I've often maybe picked up the phone, I'm looking for something, you know, whether it's an eBay or Amazon or whatever. The results are totally different than what you get off the full full blown website. Um, you. You know, I've missed, I've, I've nearly missed out on saving myself twenty quid because when I looked up for, I was looking up for a part on on Amazon and it was coming in at like fifty, sixty quid or something like that. And I went over to the laptop and I just said, "Gee, that can't be right. It's a bit overpriced." And I went over on the laptop and searched for the next thing is coming in at twenty nine ninety nine. So <laughs> it does. Um, I don't know what you know. Obviously, that's down to the website creators, but. Um, you know, websites are as well. Shopping websites are designed website first, and mobile uh, layouts are kind of a, a secondary thought on it. So maybe that's what's happening there. But getting back then to the productivity, um, you know, as David alluded earlier, try to do Excel on a on a on a smartphone or, or a tablet. It's it's very 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 difficult, you know. So um, definitely for productivity, what, office work. Pardon. What I'm, I'm just interested in what's difficult about using Excel on a, say, a smartphone compared to the, you know, I know what it's like on the laptop and so on, but yeah, how does it one work key, or not work on the on the smartphone? Well, one key thing is on a, on a PC, you will simply arrow around the grid, so it'll say A1, and you'll type in what you want, and you'll arrow down to the next cell you want and type in. You can't do that on the yeah. phone even with a keyboard it just it wants to just use normal voiceover navigation where it's just swiping across and you can't just arrow around the grid and type into cells so it's um it's, the na it's yeah it's, it's, it's the, the navigation of it i suppose uh, mm. uh navigation to you know that you need in order to be able to produce the, the stuff is now look it is doable but it's uh, a lot more work yeah and even word processors, yeah. I find they just don't quite work as well. They're just not quite as easy to navigate or the line, mm. you know, line or character or word navigation just doesn't mm. maybe work as efficiently or as smoothly as it does yeah. on PC. And also, so a lot of this is software fault. It's up to Apple yeah. and Google and Microsoft to sort it out. But. Yeah. yeah, you're dead right there, David. And often I've seen like, um, you know, you have your you have your Microsoft Office um, applications that are available for smart smartphones and tablets as well and an awful lot of features are cut out and they're and they're just not available um you know so i don't know whether that's because they're conscious of the power of the device that they're running on just doesn't have enough power to maybe have all these extra features but when you go to your desktop apps um you know all your features that you need are, are there in word and excel and powerpoint and all these extra you know all these extra things are there mm. Do you have any examples, Daniel, of what's being cut out in the mobile apps? Um, in yeah, like, um, office, yeah, like if you if you had your office three six five, your your um your dictate function is 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 not there. Um, there, there is extra menus and things that are missing. That's, uh, I don't have a list of them in the hand, but there there is I definitely think less. Accessibility checker might yeah. be missing. Yeah. Sure. There are, there are a few, there are a few, a few yeah. bits and bobs that are it's missing funny. out on it, unfortunately. It's funny though, there are, there are times where the touchscreen is helpful. Like Dan, you were talking about the shopping, and in some ways, my favourite 
uh, device to use for shopping would be the tablet because it's still got the nice kind of big screen and I'm using the web version, but yeah. those mm. shopping websites can be horrendous when it comes to yeah. screen readers. So having the ability mm. to touch mm. the screen and actually find the the bright part of the screen can be good. Yeah. So, and you have to request yeah, the website I version. Of some of them. Go on, oh, sorry, I, I find shopping on the iPhone, iPhone is pretty much an, is, is shopping on the iPhone is a nightmare. It just I get constantly <laughs> frustrated with it. Yeah. Uh, Des, are you using apps or do you use uh, do you access a website? What do you typically do for shopping? Uh, well, I've begun yeah, I've begun into things like the Amazon app or yeah, oh, yeah. um, the, well, uh, so yeah, I just find it difficult on the phone. I miss things and you know, if there are essential fields and so on and, and sometimes I just don't pick it up and possibly it's me, but I, I don't find it easy. Yeah, OK, so I'm mm. uh, I'm thinking um, from from what's being said there, is it the case then that this is kind of just not even a, not even a contest here with um, with productivity? Is there a case to be made for for mobile options at all? I think there is to, to a degree. I think that the lads have made a very good point about Excel. I I, I personally couldn't use Excel on my phone for long. I think it would just tell you mad. So, um, but in terms of productivity, I think it's worth noting as well. It's like a lot of the, the flagship smartphones these days, like in terms of internal spec, they're comparable to a lot of like modern day computers, like mini computers. So they're able to longer lasting batteries, better processing powers that are comparable to like I say a mid range desktop. Mm -hmm. You take for example, like an iPhone 13 Pro, it's, I know it's high spec, you know, high high end phone, expensive, but you know, it has eight gigs of internal RAM. Um, in terms of internal storage as well, most of the phones they use will hover between maybe 16 gigs, 120 gigs of RAM, sometimes more, depending on what the user needs. And then we can take a sweat think as well as some Android phones, like some impressive ones like the OnePlus 7. It comes with a massive 12 gigs of RAM, 258 gigs of internal storage, all for a price tag of around about 600 euro. It's really impressive. Um, so yeah, it's worth noting that mm. like the, the 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 specs of some of the the, the flagship phones are are so say somewhat comparable but to. Are you, are the, you the kind computers. of are you kind of comparing the creme de la creme of? Uh, yeah, it's a fair point. It's a fair point. You know, you're you're just your mid range of laptops. Yeah, and I think as well that it's not a. It's not really mm. the specs that are holding back the phones and the tablets. It's the software mm. that's holding them back. Mm. That's a good point, Dave. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, it is. So are we talking then in that case that if the if the specs of the the phones and tablets and I suppose it's, it is worth mentioning that we're we're not just talking about phones here. We're t we are talking about mm. things like your iPads and your your mm -hmm. other, um, your Android tablets as well. Um, if the specs can be can be good enough. Um, is that enough for the, the average user then? Because I suppose we could talk about uh, this, the, the differences between mobile options and a PC all day. And we would find things where the PC is going to be the only one that will be able to do a particular task, for example. And probably you'll find tasks that the mobile options are the only ones that will do that task well. Um, so if that's the case, if they've both got their own strengths, the debate is probably more about the average user. Mm. So is the productivity options on a tablet or a smartphone or something like that, is it enough for the average user? Depends what you mean by productivity probably. But, yeah. Um, it's, it's a tough so, one to call. You know, it is a mm. tough one to call because I suppose it's down to the individual circumstances. Like, um, you know, even David there gave an example of his mum, you know, an average user um, who doesn't need a laptop, but there could be someone, there could be someone there who who, who might like, um, you know, they the, the might be in their, in their local club, you know, and their job might be to produce a monthly newsletter for their local club or sports, sports organization or something like that. Would it be as well to, would it be as well with a laptop producing that? Probably, mm. but not mm. everybody is going to be in that kind of role, um, you know, a, a standard user either. Um, so yeah, it's it's if you need to do office -y things and you need the use of, you know, for, for producing um, newsletters, information, maybe, or even maintaining a website or something like that, you're probably going to be better off with your laptop. Um, 
but obviously you probably have your smartphone anyway along the side for out taking photographs and and doing all the usual stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's probably simply mm. is like managing your email and using the web and stuff. Absolutely, mm. absolutely mm. can do it. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's kind of interesting. I have found yeah. from like the point of view of of writing articles and so on that the phone is actually fine for it. So it's compared to when I used to be citing yeah. them to do it. Yeah. yeah, there are yeah. great apps, yeah. Um, mm. And compared to when I was cited, I'm much, much slower because the whole text editing is, yeah. because, you know, I'm relatively new to it and it's really slow to be cutting and pasting and all that sort of thing. Mm. But it worked fine. Um, uh, and I've Des, are you, are you, you using it? Use to use. Are you using Des? Sorry, like a Bluetooth keyboard yeah. or anything? If you're writing articles, do you use a Bluetooth keyboard? Yeah, if you're oh, writing absolutely. articles, yeah. Oh, you God, do. I couldn't yeah. use the yeah. Mm -hmm. keyboard. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I, I couldn't do it without it. And, um, yeah. I, I strongly dislike the, the built-in keyboard, especially with the standard typing, because you have to essentially tap each letter three times. That's after mm -hmm. you find it. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So I would, yeah. I would be very very unkeen on the standard keyboard, but once I have the, all I have to do is switch on the Bluetooth keyboard and it takes over and it's fantastic. I just have a few bump ons on the, on the relevant numbers and letters and away I go and it's great. Yeah. So as, I guess the, as, as an accessory, the Bluetooth keyboard is, for me, on the phone is essential to do anything. Mm. So if I was going off for a weekend, I would, you know, I'd have the phone in my pocket, but in the backpack would definitely be a Bluetooth keyboard. Mm. I think as well, things mm. they could improve on that would be things like on the PC and on Mac for that matter, there's a lot more keyboard shortcuts that you can use as a screen reader user or even as not a non-screen mm. reader user. Yeah. That's still in the early days, I think, with um, mm. yeah, so yeah. even managing, mm. you know, you getting around your iPad or your iPhone with your Bluetooth keyboard can be done, but it's they just haven't implemented as many. They have some, but mm. not as many. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. There seems to be yeah. kind of less uh, less keyboard shortcut available to the the smartphone or in the smart tablet mm. world. Do you feel like there's any kind of key points that that we haven't touched on that you'd you'd feel like would swing it one way or the other? So, for example, there's there's some of the obvious things like, for example, the actual portability and mobility of of the mobile mm. devices is a, a serious. You'd imagine is a serious pro. Is there a particular benefit to data storage options that might be with a desktop. Are there any of the points that we haven't covered that you feel is actually important to, to talk about that swings it one way or the other? Hmm. Interesting question. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's probably a few things. Portability is something all right, Jude. You know, this is a big advantage of smartphones. They're lightweight, a bit in your pocket. Uh, it's not to take anywhere with you. Um, the tablet obviously well. won't. Battery is another one. Um, accessories as well. Okay, there was arguments for both sides there when it comes to accessories. I know, I know, with, uh, iPhone and abusing. You know, we have AirPods, which I rely on quite a lot for calls. You know, listening to podcasts or you know streaming apps like Netflix and so on. Um, AirTags I've started using occasionally. Um, yeah. So, but I'm, of course, I'm not, I'm not going to disregard any any of the very cool apps or accessories for um. Uh, your computer as well, which, which are, yeah. of course there are lots of, but uh, yeah, portability accessories would be something else. Um, two other points. Is there something to be said? I suppose that you can get up and walk away from a PC or a laptop. You know, you can close the lid and yeah. that's it. It's done. It's like screen time on a mobile. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, no, whereas your phone, like it's it's left there for yeah. twenty minutes, and you're, you know, maybe you're. E eating your second spud for the dinner and bing bing off go off it goes and, oh no what's now there's something to be said for that yeah yeah absolutely i think that's a yeah. really important point to make as well yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Discipline. Yeah. 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 yeah yeah do not disturb mode or what have you but yeah, yeah. Actually, you know it's, it's a good point yeah i've started using this uh, sleep mode on on my my own mobile just in the last few weeks guys actually because i find um it's very easy to just switch it on uh, as you know throughout the night and you'd be kind of mindlessly scrolling through different pages and so on so switch it on just be a bit more disciplined yeah, yeah. yeah. Des mentioned earlier like you're going away for a weekend or something i'd be like i would only bring the ipad probably i wouldn't bring the laptop if i was going away for a yeah. weekend unless i yeah. knew i had to do some had to do something that mm. you see like yeah. it is more can, yeah, yeah. can i ask approachable then, Dave, more nicer <laughs> can i ask you then dave w would that thing that you when you say if you were going away for a weekend you'd have the ipad with you 
unless you had to do something specific, would that specific thing be work based? Work or sort of kind of work related, like pod, you know, things that are productive yeah, yeah. aren't my job, like podcasts, you know, recording a podcast or something like that. Or because again, yeah. I just wonder, is that is that kind of actually part of the the answer here is we're talking about an average user, but the average user is going to have different needs. So you might have to use a computer for your work and you might not be able to complete your work tasks without it. And so if you're going to do a work job, you're going to have to have yeah. your and PC. I have thought about it because I have a Windows laptop for work um, mm. and I have a Mac laptop as my personal device. And I have wondered, like when that hits its end of life, do I actually need two laptops in my life or yeah, yeah. on the personal side, mm. maybe I'll be OK with just like that, you know, so That's I don't know the answer yeah. to that yet, but it's just. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think we've got kind of a good a good sense of where the, the pros and cons are. I'm not sure what the teams are anymore, but I feel like what I might do is come <laughs> back to just <laughs> I think we might come back to maybe Daniel and JP just to articulate the final arguments, if you like. So, Daniel, if we come to you first, um, just if you were to kind of put your final points together of uh, from everything we've talked about or anything that we haven't mentioned, yeah, as it, what, like the, 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 what would your position be? The question, the question is, do I need a PC anymore? Um, it's 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 down to personal circumstances. If there's if there's a bit of productivity, I'd I'd say you probably do. If you're just you know, if you're just going to be uh, maybe surfing the web a little bit and things like that, um, probably not. You'll get away with a decent tablet. Um, yeah, very good. You know, but yeah, uh, on on the round like it is down to it is down to first and circumstance and what and what what you need to get done. Uh, certain things are way better done on a PC laptop. Certain things are way better done on a tablet. Very good. You know, for instance, and if you're going, if you're, if you're going out photographing the, the the birds on on the lake, yeah. you're not going to bring yeah. your laptop. You want to bring your yeah. smartphone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good point. Horses for so, horses. <laughs> <laughs> and JP, let's come to you finally. Yeah, yeah, thanks. And I liked your your opening um, quote from some Steve Jobs, Jude. It, it made me think of another one, which was, um, I think he remarked, it's not a slight dig at uh, Bill Gates to say that uh, PowerPoint presentations are for people who don't know what they're talking about. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in fairness, our, we're, our slides are quite uh, quite basic, and anyway, just more more of a, a few words. <laughs> so that's uh, that was interesting. Maybe think about another quote from Bill Gates this time, which is going back to when he founded Microsoft to have a computer, aim of having a computer on every desk in every home yeah, around the yeah. world. And of course, that's become very much a reality. It's no, I think there's, any, there's no denying in, in the rise in popularity of desktop computers that become much mm. more affordable and smaller in the last 40 years. Um, so at the same time, then you know we have to take into on, on board the evolution of smartphones. You know, they're much newer. You know, looking already in the last 30 years. As I think it was 92 when IBM created the first smartphone, so that's it's quite new technology. But then, some of the lying as well that they're literally taking over the world as well. Billions of people using them every day. I think you mentioned earlier about does the average person still need a PC? The, the, the operative word being the average. Maybe some people might not be um, as, as practical or affordable. But uh, you know, I, I th I'll be honest. I think there are there's, there's there's advantages, there's use cases for both, um, and that's coming from someone who does use both devices as they in work. And for you know just entertainment and pleasure use, um, but yeah, I mean I suppose if you take away one in the morning, I'd probably be holding onto my mobile very tightly. But I, I yeah, couldn't yeah. do my could I could I could not couldn't do my work without my computer. Yeah, yeah I'm sure a lot of people be the same and would yeah. rely heavily on, on their computer as well. So yeah. who would have thought it? We finished a big debate with the voice of reason from both sides. It sounds like <laughs> there's agreement, <laughs> and uh, it's uh, certainly it, it's it's an interesting one to to finish on as well. I like that quote that you mentioned a moment ago. That that's probably very well known as well from Bill Gates, mm. or how that idea of to have um, a PC in every home, because that probably gives us a nice context to kind of round out this debate. Do I need a PC anymore? Well, for every individual, the answer is probably going to be a bit different. Um, the average user, you could probably still argue it either way and it's 50-50 a little bit. But the process of it being this situation where every home has a PC has probably started to actually um, go backwards, if you like, in that, that probably not every home needs a PC anymore. Not every home has a PC mm -hmm. and the 
mm. probably don't see the, the need for it. So maybe mm -hmm. we're kind of moving a little bit away from the Bill Gates view and a little bit more towards it's, 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 Steve it's Jobs like view. The, it's, it's nearly like the same debate, um, mobile data or, or landline, yeah. Robin. Yeah. You know? mm. Do you really That's need it. that yeah, landline yeah. anymore? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's exactly very, yeah. very yeah. interesting. Yeah. Mm. Very good. So that was our, our big debate and uh, really good to, to get the views of the, the panel there. Uh, so we appreciate that. We're nearly at the end of our show today. Um, we've just about got time for a, a brief tech tip. Maybe we could go back to JP for a moment. What have we got yeah. uh, briefly course, today? Yeah, sure. A quick, quick tech tip. Quick tech tip, I should say. Uh, so <laughs> Amazon has finally given Alexa a masculine sounding voice option. Uh, that was just announced the last few weeks in Ireland. So for the first time since Alexa's introduction, which was in 2013, Amazon has added a new masculine voice. So it's now available, as I say, in Ireland. And to do this, we can just say, Alexa, change your voice. And Alexa will respond by saying, OK, you're all set. I'll be the voice you hear when you wake me up. So yeah, that's really it. It'll be interesting to hear which voice people prefer, and uh, the original one or the new one, will it, will it be used or not? But we know it, it's now available. The only, only thing to note is that the new voice won't be able to read aloud at the moment, won't be able to read aloud your Kindle box if you try to do that. OK, OK, so that's mm. kind of interesting yeah. to know as well. Yeah, yeah. it is, yeah. Okay. Very good. Well, that's a, yep. that's our tech tip for the week. Appreciate that, JP. Okay. And uh, we'll be back with uh, another tech tip in our next show as well. So that pretty much brings the show to a close today. Hope you've enjoyed the discussion and please do let us know if there's anything that you'd like us to cover in the future as well. Good to have our panel with us today. Des, are you going to join us again sometime? Yeah, love to do that. Anytime you like. Right. Yeah. Very good. And Dave, will we get you back? If you'll have me, I'd love to. Thank you. <laughs> that's great. Good stuff. We look forward to it on uh, one of our future shows. So that'll be good to hear from Des and Dave again. Um, but just to finish up, we'll have just a, a few reminders. If you're uh, needing uh, any assistance for uh, with your technology, you can get support from the labs team from 9 to 5, Monday to Friday on 1800 911, or you can email labs at ncbi.ie. Or if you want to. There. Is that, say, 9 -1 -1 -1 -1 -1 -1 say that again? 910. What did I say? Did I say something different? 1 800 911. <laughs> Oh, did I? I <laughs> just guessed the last three. <laughs> you forgot the last three digits. Just pick any last three digits that you want and see who you get through to and let us know on <laughs> 1800-911-110. Very good. When you eventually get through, through to uh, <laughs> lab support. I'm glad you picked me up on that, Daniel. Very good. And NCBI uh, services in general, if you want to get in touch, it's 1800-911 and uh, the last three digits here are 250 or you can email info at ncbi.ie. And of course, we always appreciate your support of NCBI. If you'd like to make a donation to help support our services, you can do that through donate.ncbi.ie. Just before we go, just a reminder of what we'll be talking about in our next live event. We're going to be talking about ad blockers. Are they worth it? Now, you've probably heard a bit about ad blockers before. We've talked about it a bit on the show before. But we're going to just talk about some of the considerations as to uh, how good they are. And also, is there is there an argument to be made against using them for, uh, on some occasions as well? So we'll talk about that on the show next uh, next time. We're also going to be talking about Safer Internet Day. What's that about? We're also going to have some equipment reviews. So um, we mentioned earlier we'll have some equipment reviews from uh, some of the service users and our listeners and user reviews basically, but we'll also have some from the IT trainers from NCBI Labs. So we look forward to that as well. Our next show is going to be two weeks time. So that's Tuesday, February 1st, uh, 2022 at the usual time of 2.30. And if you want to stay up to date with uh, what's happening on our uh, new show, our Talking Technology with NCBI Labs, you can sign up to the the newsletter. You can subscribe to that on our website or you can email us again at labs at ncbi.ie. So that all, that's, all that's left for me to do is to thank our guests today, Des Keeney and Dave Nason. Really good to have you on the show with us today. And of course, thanks to everybody listening in as well. And from Daniel, JP and myself, goodbye for now. And we look forward to having you all back with us next time for Talking Technology with NCBI Labs. <laughs>